Republican replacement for Obamacare could already be in trouble. Well, the American Health Care Act is one that supported President Trump. Some conservatives in the Congress have already called it Obamacare light. Some are calling it Obamacare 2.0. Moderates are mad the bill will defund Planned Parenthood temporarily. And, of course, Democrats have no interest at all in gutting the, president's, the former president's signature accomplishment. Who loves this bill? Does it have hope of becoming law? We're joined now by Republican Congressman Buddy Carter of Georgia. He supports the new bill. Congressman, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you. So like a lot of people paying attention, I've been spending a lot of the day trying to figure out what this bill says, what the implications are. And some of it seems good, some of it I don't fully understand. But I keep thinking, it's been seven years. Is this the, is this the best that Congress can produce after all those years of promising to replace Obamacare with something better? Well, first of all, let's keep in mind that this is the first step. There are other steps that we have to go right. through. This is, but this is what we're doing in reconciliation. This is what the, the first bucket looks like. We described it as three buckets. We've still got two buckets left before right. we have our final product. But this is a very important part, of, especially of the repeal process. And let's face it, Tucker, we've got to do something. I yep. mean, the, the Obamacare is imploding. This is, this is something that, that responsible people and members of Congress, we understand that we've got to rescue health care, and that's what we're trying to do. I think most people agree with you, and that's why Republicans control both houses of the Cong both mm -hmm. chambers, and that's why they control the majority of governorships and state legislatures and the White House, in part because they've told their voters, look, this is a disaster, Obamacare. It's never gotten majority support. We're going to give you something better. And so the question remains... Why is it a multi-step process? Why does it seem so disorganized? Why wasn't it ready to go a month and a half ago? Well, it has been ready. If you remember, we, we, we rolled out our Better Way plan, and in that we gave the major ideas of what we wanted to do. We want to have more accessible, more affordable, patient-centered health care. Listen, right. I, I, I'm the only pharmacist currently serving in Congress. I was a health care right. professional in my professional life, and, and I know how personal health care is. I know how important it is to people, and it's important that we have competition and choices in health care. Right now, we don't have that with Obamacare. Right. Right? You know, just this weekend in Tennessee, we found out that we're going to have 16 counties don't have any choice whatsoever. Right. We've got... And, and that's clearly bad. I mean, I don't think it answers the question after seven years why it's not fully ready to go, but let's get to the specifics here. So the individual mandate is very unpopular. Polling has showed that consistently mm -hmm. over all these years. This is Rand Paul, Senator Paul of Kentucky's assessment of, of your bill. He said it keeps the individual mandate but makes you pay insurance companies, not the government. So there's still a requirement to buy insurance in this, correct? Well, no, not at all. What we're okay. doing, instead of penalizing people and taxing them for not having insurance, what we're going to do is we're going to reward them with a tax credit for having insurance. Now, I suspect what Senator Paul is talking about there is, is the refundable tax credits. And what that is intended to do is to make sure those people who don't necessarily benefit from a tax credit, right. that they can get the tax credit in automatically and then buy insurance with it. That's what we intend for that to, d to do. Okay, so there's no penalty at all. If I don't want, if I'm what used to be called a free rider and don't feel like getting insurance and continue to go to the emergency room for my health care, that's okay. There's no penalty at all for me. Well, there's not a penalty, but what we're going to do again there's is... There's no extra cost for me. Well, no, except that you don't have insurance. And, and right. You know, what we're trying to do, we're, we're not trying to be punitive here. What we're trying to do is reward and to empower people. That's the key. Right. Of course, I, I get all that. But here's the central problem that Obamacare tried to tackle. I think it did a bad job, but it's still a problem, which is that the older segment of the population, which is also the richest, by the way, consumes the overwhelming majority of health care dollars. The youngest segment doesn't want to buy insurance because they perceive that they don't need it, and most of them actually don't. You need to get them, the healthy, to pay for the sick in order for it to work hence the individual mandate. This bill doesn't answer that problem at all? No, well, we don't, unlike Obamacare, we don't want to discriminate. We, we don't want to discriminate and, and we're not going to. And what we're trying to do, again, is to empower people. We feel like that, that people who are able to make their own health care choices do a better job than this cookie cutter approach that Washington, D.C. thinks that we know best and we can tell you what you need in health care. That simply is not working. So if my kids or anyone's kids decide, you know what, I'm 27 years old, I can no longer ride along with my parents' insurance policy, I don't feel like getting insured. The government has nothing to say about that. No one's going to force them to do that. Well, that, that has been the punitive nature of uh, right. Okay, I just want to be clear on it because right. there's a lot of debate about what this uh, legislation actually says. So the, the ban on uh, Insurance companies discriminate against those with pre-existing conditions yes. stands, as does the ban on lifetime limits uh, that insurance companies posed on, on patients. How is it insurance exactly? 
if we're requiring insurance companies to insure people whose policies they are certain will lose money. That's not really insurance, is it? It's something else. No, and, and, and listen, the insurance companies are going to be a big part of this. Of we've, we've got to see what products they're going to come out with, and those products are going to be important into what the market will bear and what the market needs, and I'm sure that's what they will come out with. Okay, but you can't run an insurance. I mean, insurance is a bet, right, that you'll pay more to them than they will pay you in the end, right? It's, it's, it's based on a wager that they make. That's what insurance is. Right. So, but if the government says you have to take people on whom you know you will lose money, then by definition, those insurance companies need government subsidies or they fail, right? Well, we, we're, one of the big stalwarts of our plan is Medicaid reform. We, we know that this is, listen, you know, this has been called Obamacare. It should have been called Obamacaid. Out of the three-fourths of the people who have been added to the insurance rolls have been added to Medicaid through Medicaid expansion. Right. Medicaid was never intended to be for able-bodied adults. It was always intended to be a safety net for those who need it the most, for the aged, the blind, the disabled, the children who need it the most. But instead, it's turned out to be through Obamacare as, as for able-bodied adults. We've got to address that. We've got to get Medicaid back. And we've got to pass the responsibility and partner with the states. They can do a much more efficient, much right. more effective job than we can do. Well, maybe. I mean, they're pretty good at fleecing the federal government, I noticed. But um, <laughs> if you talk to any governor, anybody involved in Medicaid in the states, and they're honest with you, they'll say that non-citizens account for a big proportion, in some states, a big proportion of their spending right. on Medicaid. It's not a small thing at all. It's not just like some right-wing hobby horse. It's a real thing. What does this legislation do to prevent people who aren't here legally, who are not citizens, from taking advantage of the largesse of the government? Well, again, what this legislation does, those people won't be getting tax credits. Obviously, those people aren't filling out tax forms, and they're not filling out to, to get a tax rebate or anything, so they're not going to be benefiting from any kind of tax credits at all. Federally, but they can still ride along and, and use the state Medicaid, right? Well, is there anything in here that says that people here legally cannot take advantage of this program? Well, I think that's incumbent upon the states to make sure that's not happening. But some states won't do that. I mean, New York, California, they're not going to prevent illegals well, from no. using this, and that's well, okay? Well, no, it's not okay. Not in my mind, at least. Right, but does the legislation address it? I guess that's what I mean. Not that, that I'm aware of, but okay. I do know that it does leave that up to the states to be monitored by the states. Hmm. Um, Obamacare taxes are still mm -hmm. in here. And not all of them will be repealed. The bulk won't be repealed until 2018. Why is that? Right. Well, one of the things that we promised is, is a, a stable transition period. In order to have that stable transition period, we've got to make sure people, because everyone's concerned, and I get it. Listen, I had town hall meetings, and, and yeah. they expressed to me how concerned they were about it. And I get that and I understand that, that health care is personal. But we promised we're not going to yank the rug underneath, out from underneath anyone. In order to do that, we've got to have a glide path, if you will. We've got to have a stable transition period. This didn't happen overnight. It's not going to change overnight. What does this cost? And how many people will lose their coverage as a result? Well, two things. First of all, we haven't gotten the, the cost estimates back yet from the CBO. But I mean, well, of course, it hasn't been scored officially. Right. But, I mean, you're not going to release something like this to the public without giving us some sense of its cost. Of well, course. we feel like we can make it, especially over a period of time, we feel like we can bring down health care costs. We feel By like how we much can, over what period? Well, that remains to be seen. But if we increase competition, if we increase choices, if we increase patient responsibility, then we will be able well, to... Well, wait, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't want to be a jerk about it or press you too hard or anything, but I mean, this is the story of the day. This affects Absolutely. everybody in the country, 330 million. And so you've got to give us some sense of what it's going to cost, where the money's going to come from, who's going to lose coverage. I mean, you're rolling it out today. What's the answer? Right. Well, the answer is that we're going to create a market that in healthcare, that's going to be much more competitive. It's going to have more choices. It's going to be patient-centered. And that's going to create a market that will be much more affordable to people. How much more? I, that remains to be seen. I mean, so I when, can't give you a figure that tells you this is how much it's going to save. So when Nancy Pelosi says lots of people are going to lose their health insurance because of this, what's no, your response? We, we, my response is just the opposite. I think people are going to have access to health care and better health care. And they're going to be empowered in their health So healthcare. people are not going to lose their health insurance because of this? They, it will be accessible. They will have the opportunity to, to have health care. I can assure you Can you that. see why this makes people nervous if you roll I, something I out without, without any details? That's I mean, right. look, I'm not against it. I just want to know what the details I, are. I understand. I understand. But, but again, that's why we want to make sure we have a stable transition period. If you will note, when Tom Price became Secretary of Health and Human Services, the first thing he did when he got into office was to shore up the Affordable Care Act to make sure that it can last us right. through this transition period. All right. Congressman Carter, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it.